Good morning. So we are, yeah, everyone's awake, I see. Wonderful. Coffee. Lots of coffee, <laughs> excellent. Glad to get you all caffeinated before our session. So I'm Andrew Jacobs. I'm a uh, senior solutions architect with Mark Logic, and we are all very excited to be here today to talk about something that I hope is as near and dear to your heart as it is to mine, uh, namely data integration. So throughout my entire career, uh, data has been a big focus. But particularly in the last three years, I've had the ability uh, and chance to work with many federal agencies and helping them to figure out how they can better integrate their data. And so today, we hope to have a conversation uh, with our esteemed panelists about what data integration looks like today, what the, some of the challenges are, uh, and how they're approaching them. For the last 10 minutes or so, we'll open it up and we'll do some Q&A. But to start off with, I'll turn the time over to our panelists and let them introduce themselves and give you a little bit of background about the agencies and organizations that they represent so you get a feeling for the type of data challenges that they are dealing with. Tony? So Tony Casa, I'm with USDA, uh, as that was announced. Um, so we have a very diverse mission in the USDA from forest service to insurance, right, for the farmers and protecting their investments and providing them a, a backdrop in the event of weather disasters and those type of things. We also do statistics. So we have a very diverse mission, very uh, interesting data needs across that forum and how do we integrate all of those things and, and use that data to make decisions and help our constituents, help our stakeholders. We also work with academia closely in order to leverage information for them and, and their research and what they're doing and, and the universities and the research of agriculture and farming. Um, very important mission. Uh, we, we feed everybody, we impact everybody in this room and everybody. In a, we also deal with foreign agriculture. So we have a lot of different data sets and a lot of different information that we collect that are leveraged for uh, you know, very diverse activities. So, Charlie? Hi, I'm Charlie Rothwell. I'm the director of the National Center for Health Statistics. And um, um, in the United States, we have a decentralized uh, statistical system. There are 13 uh, federal statistical agencies. You're probably familiar with the Bureau of Census, the Bureau of Labor Statistics, NCHS uh, it monitors the nation's health. We have our own uh, data collection survey systems and registration systems that we monitor the nation's health uh, about. Uh, information that you get or you have for uh, growth charts on your children, um, uh, issues of obesity, um, uh, emerging diseases, mortality, teenage pregnancy, sexual practices, you name it, we collect it. Um, as a fiscal agency, although we're in CDC, we, we are freestanding and we have protection, so we collect what we're supposed to be collecting and we publish what, we're, uh, what we decide to publish and we have to provide the data that backs up uh, our information um, so that people know that we're not cooking the books. Um, we basically um, <clears throat> inform the policy debate, and we never, we assiduously stay out of the debate <laughs> itself. Arthur? So I'm Arthur Real, our director at the World Bank. Uh, when people hear the title uh, World Bank, uh, they think either Wall Street, like Morgan Stanley, Goldman Sachs, or Main Street, like Citibank, Bank of America, we're neither. Um, we're actually a 25,000 person organization uh, looking to eliminate poverty and enhance shared prosperity in the world. Um, we do lots of projects uh, around the world. We loan money to various countries and we provide uh, information and knowledge about those types of projects. It's one of our strategic advantages in that, in that space. Um, obviously, we share uh, problems on data and data integration with any organization of our size and our age, uh, where data sort of grew organically. Um, so things like our enterprise search program identifies 43 different sources of data uh, that need to be incorporated and somehow folded together and provide uh, proper relevancy when we go to return our uh, results to our people. But uh, we have a number of complications in that space, and I'm sure we'll be talking lots about that over the next half hour. So I look forward to that. Thank you. So before we get into some of the specific challenges that we all face with data integration, I wanted to start off by looking at the driving forces. Specifically, when you look at what the missions are that you're all trying to accomplish, 
What are some of the driving forces for data integration that you encounter? Well, uh, in USDA, obviously compliance is a big area, a driving force, and I like to talk about it because that's, a, that's an area that we're invested in that can be also leveraged for other things that we do with data. So um, we, we generate informational report cards on all the agencies and where they stand with security and where they stand with compliance activities. And those report cards are dashboards that you know, reference their state of compliance and where they're at. And that report actually influences their direction and priorities and improving those compliance activities. Um, some of the other areas we deal with is geospatial areas and, uh, you know, the geographic locations and all that. We want to share that information across lines, across the diverse missions, so we know how to uh, identify data across land masses and those type of things. And then that influences precision agriculture, which is where we get direct information on what the farming community is doing, and that supports insurance activities and other things. So. Pretty much the same, actually, in, in, in health. Um, we need to provide uh, data quicker and, and of higher quality. And in order to do this, you have to look at not just your own data systems, but uh, systems elsewhere to either supplement or modify the data that you have. And um, as you do this, one of the unfortunate outcomes of this is that we had this push and pull to try to provide more information to the public and policymakers, and at the same time, because people are providing this information to us in institutions with the provision of anonymity, that we can protect their privacy. So how do you do this when you have the more and more data sets outside that can be through the mosaic effect, uh, then with our information, actually identify an institution or a person. So getting more timely information and more robust information at more granular level has the, uh, the problem of protecting confidentiality. And this is the push and pull, the yin and yang that we have um, um, in our area. So at the World Bank, we have many uses for the data. Some of it's very similar to what you just heard, where uh, we'll have donors provide us trust funds, uh, and what they want to know is, you spent $300 million of our money, what did we get for it, what are the results? Uh, and you find out we have some data that talks about who donated to a trust fund, then we have separate data that talks about grants that got issued from those trust funds, and then we've got teams on the ground who actually executed the projects and collected data, and trying to put all of that together from three or four disparate sources of data becomes very complicated. So part of our problem is, uh, is sort of how do we determine for our external parties what we've done? Another area is internal. Uh, I speak with the Minister of Agriculture in Burundi. They want an $80 million loan to do drip irrigation. How do I find the 15 people at the bank who have done drip irrigation in various parts of the world? How do we bring those types of things together? Uh, and still further, want, we want to use it to tune our programs. So what's becoming uh, apparent now, uh, we used to, our teams used to sit down with government officials and plan you know, a program for a country. Uh, what we're starting to do on a pilot basis is collecting social media data, uh, extracting the sentiment of a population of a country to try to find out what it is they're looking for from their, from their government and try to reconcile that with the program that we've created with the leaders of the government, look for gaps, look for misalignment, uh, and bring those together. So part of it is guiding how we move forward uh, in the future. So Arthur, you mentioned social media data. Uh, and, and as I listen to all of you, Sounds like there are a lot of good reasons for bringing the data together. I'm curious though, what are some of the challenges that you face on the ground? I mean, you're bringing data together that you own, that you're collecting, uh, things from social media, maybe things that other countries uh, have created. What challenges do you face when you're trying to bring all that together to, to have a common, consistent view of it? You want me to go first? Uh, so, uh, well, many challenges. I could go on forever about the challenges, but I think it's, uh, I think you mentioned all the, the, the need to bring together all the business units and the diverse areas and identify the subject matter experts around data is, is a very difficult thing to do. Everybody has their priorities, their mission, and their activities. And we as IT folks can understand the data, understand how to integrate it, understand the technology around it. 
But the truth of the matter is the business side needs to be a driver and a partner in that. And then the community around us, the academia and the industry that we work with needs to be a partner in that. We have to create standards. We have to partner together in order to create common definitions, use the data similarly so that when we invest in technology, we don't have to invest in 15 different capabilities for each of those business areas. So. You know, um, I'm glad this is called data integration. Um, I remember back, uh, and this has nothing to do with data, but it will in a, in a moment. Um, we were uh, looking at, we were in a scientific organization. I was in a scientific organization that was reorganizing. And it was all about, um, all about matrix management and how that was going to solve uh, all our problems. <laughs> and I listened to this and listened to this and listened to this. And, um, and finally, I got exasperated, as I normally do. And, um, and I said, you know, um, the reason why we're good, and this was a fine organization, is that we have silos of excellence. And what you're asking us to be are matrices of mediocrity. <laughs> um, uh, well I think what Charles. I well think put. now let's get to data. The data and the systems should be aimed at the functions that they're supposed to um, support. And if they're really good at that, and yet there are ways to link into it, then I would submit that uh, data integration is possible, and that is better than trying to develop systems overall that try to do everything and actually do nothing very well. And so the idea of data integration to me is, is one is to try to take advantage of those systems that uh, we can. The unfortunate thing in government is that there is legislation many times in place that pr preclude that type of uh, um, uh, activity. And by the way, there's a commission right now that uh, Congress has put in place. Uh, uh, it's called the uh, um, um, something policy uh, 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 based data decision making, I think, or something of that nature. But they're going to be looking at, and they are looking at, ways of possibly changing legislation and uh, making data available so they can be uh, moved back and forth between various departments and government. Uh, hopefully, that will take place. But before that takes place, I think it, uh, it, there are many times there are restrictions in government that are really not legislative. It's just that you don't want to do business with somebody else. And that's what we have to work against. There, there, there are policies in place. Those policies can be changed. And you can put in place a memorandums of understanding that, that allow various organizations to use data for various purposes and, and control it in that manner. So I think there's, there are many ways of getting data integration, not through technology, but through understanding of, of partnerships uh, in government. Yeah, I think one of our big challenges, and, and I've seen this, uh, I've worked all over Wall Street, and I've seen this all, all there, and I've seen it at the World Bank, uh, it's getting a common uh, taxonomy, a common understanding of when I, call, when I talk about you know, some data element X, that it has the same meaning across the institution. Uh, and that's the way you have to integrate data. You start comparing apples to oranges, you think they're apples to apples, you end up with a mess. Uh, and getting the business, the various silos, to sit down and actually talk to each other and agree on certain terms uh, becomes the defining problem because they're not motivated to do that. And the classic example I give at the World Bank, uh, if I go to the HR department and I ask them, how many work days in a year? Uh, 230, and if I ask the budget people <laughs> the same question, 220. Uh, the budget people perfectly happy working with 220, HR perfectly happy with 230. The problem is some report goes up to some senior management team and they say, oh my God, we're like $30 million shortfall between what we budgeted and what we're gonna spend on contractors uh, when that problem doesn't exist. So what do they do? They blame IT, they throw it to us. Uh, we become the convening force to try to bring the business together. Where there's a lot of pain for the business, those problems go away very quickly, all right, because they have the pain and they solve it. Where there is no pain at the silo level, it becomes nearly impossible to herd the cats into the room and get them to, to resolve it. 
Uh, and that becomes a, a big problem for us. Um, different formats, those types of things that technology easily handle, but cons the conceptual component of data becomes the, the major problem. I completely agree with that. That's just, it's a huge issue. Uh, we, we've linked uh, our surveys uh, uh, with uh, uh, registration systems, with um, uh, Medicare data. We've linked it with HUD data, for example. And you have this huge data set. Some of it is of high quality, some of it is of medium quality, and some of it is not so good. And then there are terms that sound the same in each of those data sets that have been linked together that aren't really the same. And so if you as an analyst looking at this information, what do you make of it? And so the actual curation of, this, of these data so that you can put it out there for people to make appropriate analysis of this information is really a difficult thing and an expensive one, but one that's needed. And so what I'm hearing is that that information needs to be seen in context uh, with the provenance, the pedigree, quality controls, all those things need to be taken into consideration when you're doing data integration. And Arthur, you started talking about what happens if you don't bring things together, right? It, for example, if you leave everything in a silo, uh, what are some of the hidden dangers or some of the hidden consequences of, of doing that? For example, you mentioned different calculations are going to be made and the yeah, view well, of the business is not but, going to be accurate. Yeah, if you stay within the silo, then it doesn't matter, right? So, you know, if I have one way of looking at the world, you have a different way, but I do my thing, you do your thing, it's fine. It's when inevitably we try to bring these together and as often at a senior management level, you want to bring this stuff together and look at it holistically, suddenly we're comparing apples and oranges and things don't match. Uh, and it becomes a huge reconciliation problem. And you know, people talk about all oh, this created data governance group to deal with this, but you know, the business disengages because again, you, most of the stuff is happening for you. Most of the stuff's happening for me. Everyone's happy, uh, and it generally is a, a debate between senior managers and IT. And we end up the convening power when the business really should be convening this stuff. But um, we end up more often than not because we suffer from the pain. We we deal with it and try to and try to put things together. Yeah. So it sounds like if you can't bring your data together well, uh, the steer for the ship is going to be off. The decisions that are made at the highest levels uh, could be inaccurate or based on information that's faulty, when in fact, if you look at the individual parts of the organization, they think everything's fine, right? Yeah, or if you have disparate data sets, uh, these tend to be brought together manually, which is going to obviously be error prone. <laughs> Uh, but you try to bring these together. We have to tell our donors what we did for their 300 million. It's in three different places, three different groups own the data. Uh, someone has to run around and spend a lot of money trying to bring these things together. And that's a big problem with reporting, right? So some areas we've done a lot of improvement. Uh, we've cleaned things up, reporting at a fingertip, ad hoc reporting. Uh, we have that in place, but there are other areas, you know, trust fund is one of those. That's where I bring up the example. Uh, a lot of manual work going on, a lot of people spending a lot of money to bring things together that if you solve the data problem, you get with a you know, click of the mouse, right? And you'll have your information. So right. that's, that's where we're headed. I think there's a, also a responsibility of heads of these uh, activities to do business with one another and try to explain to the public, exp uh, explain to the media uh, what uh, the information can and can't be used for. I just think back on um, in the last administration at the beginning of the last administration, there was something going on, I think it was called health insurance. <laughs> <laughs> What's that? And, um, <laughs> and um, um, my agency has been um, uh, collecting health insurance information for well over 50 years. And there's been a lot of change in health insurance uh, during that time. Uh, actually, much more change uh, during the earlier times than actually what was taking place in the last administration, but that's a different subject. Um, uh, and there was a great interest in, and the Bureau of Census, by the way, does a survey on health insurance as well. And so the Census Director and I felt it was very important to get up and give a presentation to the media and to others about how to use our two surveys and what they were really meant to do. The uh, Census survey was a terrific activity where if you really wanted to look at someone's income, and a variety of other insurance that they had, that's where you wanted to go. You didn't want to use our survey.
But if you were interested in people's health outcomes and their health insurance, then we were the place to go. And so we tried to, when you can't put the information together or when it really doesn't do any good, you better darn well be able to explain a reason why you have these two data collection systems going on that seemingly are doing the same thing, but they're really not. Yeah. So I, where I want to go next is on data agility. I mean, if you look at the world in general, and I'm sure you guys could give many examples if I were to ask you of the changes that happen inside of your organizations or agencies. How do you ensure that your data can remain as agile as your agency or your business? New policies are enacted, new practices, uh, new data sets, different ways of analyzing that data are needed. Uh, how do you guys handle that, uh, that really big challenge? Boy, that's a, that is a big challenge. Um, you know, having data at your fingertips is critical to make quick informed decisions, right? Um, data informs a decision, it doesn't make it for you. Um, you have to be aware of all kinds of things in order to make a good decision. Um, information that we collect in, in a timely manner helps us derive in uh, activities such as when a disaster happens. You know, I talked about a little bit about geospatial and farm and precision ag. If a weather incident occurs, um, we have people asking the Farm Service Agency very quickly, can you give me a, a map of the disaster? How much of the crops were impacted? What crops were impacted? That information really need, is needed very quickly in order to ascertain the actual impact of that disaster. And it could cross state lines. It crosses county lines, right? Who's asking for that information? So we have to bring all of that data together and, and, and share with the governors, with congressmen, with all the constituents, the overall impact of that data and the number of crops and, and the expected outcome of those crops from, from a produ production state, you know, that's needed in a timely manner, right? And so we have to have that data at our fingertips ready to go. It's critical, you know, so. And Charlie, as, as you think about your answer here, to put you on the spot, you mentioned earlier put the me opioid. The <laughs> opioid. You mentioned earlier yeah. the opioid uh, yeah. epidemic that's happening across the country and elsewhere in the globe. How are you guys handling that uh, from a data agility standpoint? Five years ago, I, it probably was not on your radar, and now, you know, it's probably at the forefront of, of the statistics that you need to put out. Yes, um, in general, uh, and I'll get to that. In, in, in general, what we used to do uh, and still do is uh, when you're collecting medical information. Many times you summarize uh, some very difficult terms and you have codes assigned to them, whether it's an international classification of diseases, whatever it might be. There, there's a, a way to get around misspellings, uh, uses of terms, similar terms, uh, but meaning the same thing, that type of thing. And, um, um, and so we do have codes, if you will, that uh, as we're monitoring some uh, emerging disease or emerging issue like opioid overdoses, we, we, we do have ways of uh, looking at the codes. But unfortunately, really the information you need is what are, what are the chemicals that were being taken? What was, what was, what was really uh, 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 where that person died? Where uh, really, what, what, what's the natural, you need to get to the natural language that, it, that would actually the medical examiner or the physician or the coroner provided you. And so now we have to have systems that are agile enough to be able to look at that natural language and make something of it. And because there, there, there are great differences in, in, in what some of those opioid overdose uh, um, deaths really are about. Uh, and so that is an agility issue. Um, another is um, we have a t we've had, and I can't speak for anybody else, we have this way of we have systems to collect our information and, and, to, and to make sure that it's clean and, and fresh and all that. And then we have a bunch of epidemiologists and analysts and demographers and you name it who analyze the information. Two separate processes. That can't be anymore. <laughs> what we need to do is we need to have data visualization tools that will do the quality control on the data and then 
as that data is curated and ready to go, it drops into another data visualization package that's not only available for the analysts, but it's available to the public at the same time. And that is, that's something that I think is coming. Um, we're struggling at it right now, but I think that's our future. And it, it will allow people to do, use, utilize our information much better, and it won't, it'll take some pressure off of us of trying to tell all the stories that we really can't get around to, but others should be looking at. At the World Bank, uh, we tend to deal with agility as, as sort of keeping it separate almost on a tactical track versus a, a strategic roadmap, right? So in terms of data, we'll have a strategic roadmap. There are things people are working on uh, well planned out. And then you have something like the Ebola crisis that came up some years ago, uh, which the World Bank got heavily involved with and needed to map new cases, needed to, to bring things together. Uh, it was treated as a separate effort. It doesn't interrupt you know, the existing roadmap work going on, but we basically got members of the GIS team, the, the geospatial team, uh, we got members of a Raplet application development team and you know, over a weekend put something together and started collecting this uh, and collect it sort of separately and then figure out how to weave it into the strategic vision of data, uh, which I think is critical to have a roadmap. Uh, what you shouldn't do in your organization, for those of you who have a mess of data, which pretty much everyone does, unless your company started in the last 15 years and you're Uber or something and you knew that yeah. on day one, your data was critical and was everything, right? And you, you planned for it uh, from when you were two people in a garage uh, putting this stuff together. Uh, if you're decades old and have collected data in hodgepodge fashion, do not try to start a project to clean up all your data before you do something else. You'll never get there, right? It's boiling the ocean. You want to segment that roadmap. So we also do a lot of work there looking at what gives us the most bang for the buck and focusing on those at a given point in time. It's a continuous process. Uh, to clean up data and to get a more organized data uh, landscape. So uh, to add one more thing, obviously uh, uh, something that's close to all of our, our hearts today is compliance, right, as security, having agility with our data to be proactive and predictive about impacts and security. I think we'd be mistaken not to share. Um, big data is a big area where it's going to improve our ability to position us to strengthen our security posture and strengthen our position and, and fight in any incidents. Um, data is just going to get bigger in that world and larger. And uh, we have to have quick, agile ways of identifying impacts, incidents, and researching them, where they're coming from, and then trends and information on them, how we prevent them in the future. So, Mike, you know, that's a. Go ahead. No, go ahead. I'm go. Sorry. I'm sorry. Um, just keep on this, is, is uh, um, we have a, I think, probably one of the most interesting, I, it is the most interesting survey, I think, in the world. Um, uh, it's called in Haines. And we actually go out, you may not know this, but we go out throughout the United States with trailers that are all automated inside, and um, uh, we connect them up, and we go to your house, we interview you for an hour and a half or so, we take samples of dust in your house, <laughs> that type of thing, if you'll let us do that, and then we prod and poke you for another day uh, doing very in-depth physical exams. Um, and, and from that, we're able to do uh, um, growth charts for children, we're able to uh, measure uh, uh, hypertension in the United States and cholesterol levels, and, and those people who think they're, uh, they have their cholesterol under control and they really don't, they're not taking their medication, all those types of things that we collect in this survey, very, very expensive, very expensive. Think of if we could get electronic health records really, truly standardized then what would, would we really need to do this? We would take a very expensive survey and make it much more flexible, much larger, and less onerous on the individual who's taking their time on their own to provide us this information. Um, I think this is a, um, a way of the future, uh, but it, there's a, we're a long ways away from it now. We, we, you know, even a vendor, single vendor, uh, of an electronic health record um, may institute that electronic health record very differently in various settings. Um, so it's difficult enough just to 
bring that information together from one vendor. Think of all the vendors that we do have and then try to say something from it. But I think it's our future from a health perspective. It's, and we better be agile and, and be able to figure it out. Yeah, I think that's a great example of where we would all like to, to go in the future is that ability to have our per, uh, personal health information available to us as well, right? From all of the different uh, doctors that we visit, uh, and, and we can choose to make it available to people like you and the CDC. At what level, you know, and you would have a choice of what level you want to right. provide. Yeah. You know. <clears throat> Well, we've only got a few minutes left, and a whole bunch of questions have come in on the magical iPad. And so uh, uh, let's see how many we can get through here. Like many others, my Fed agency's customer service staff is in a perpetual state of overwhelm. Too many customers, too few staff. How does the drive toward data integration help them? Hmm. Hmm. Stump the oh, experts. Boy. Yeah. No. I, <laughs> I mean, that's the, a long conversation, I think. <laughs> yeah, I mean, in theory, the, the faster you can get access to lessons learned, you can get answers to things faster and move more tickets through the system quicker. We're yeah. doing a lot of that work on our help desk, right, at the World Bank, where frequently asked questions, especially for new people on the help desk, they get up to speed faster and can answer things uh, and more directly. But um, I think uh, self service. Opportunity sounds right there is where, as you shared with, with the help desk and that concept, uh, sharing information where self-service can be attained can reduce the level of effort on a service desk. I don't know if it's an IT service desk or a program service desk of any type, but in both cases, I think uh, having the ability of having that information facts right at the fingertips and collecting common trends, data elements, that, you know, from the tickets and from the information being received and how we fix those things, I think are, is important. I think you can reduce a lot of effort, a lot of phone calls into a service desk if you have self-service opportunities. So. Yeah. Fine. Yeah. Arthur, is that something, you mentioned earlier that you were working on an enterprise search project. You were bringing together 43 different data sources. Uh, is the vision for that that people would be able to get answers to frequently asked questions and other sorts of information that otherwise would uh, incur a lot of staff costs and energy and effort to go across these 45 or 43 individual silos uh, individually? Yeah, so um, I mean, there's a lot of different tentacles to this thing, but one big part of it is to make sure our internal search works. If I need certain forms, uh, if I want access to certain projects, I can get them very quickly <clears throat> and accurately. Um, and we've had a lot of problems with relevance. The more data and, and types of data you incorporate, the harder it is to tune your relevancy scores to get things in front of people. The next phase of that is really to look at, depending on who I am, uh, I, I, I want different things to be relevant, right? So if I'm a team task leader in the field, uh, when I do a search on Thailand, I'm probably looking for bank projects in Thailand. When it's Arthur Real and ITS, I'm looking to go on vacation, right? And start showing me vacation <laughs> sites. I'm probably not looking at projects. Um, and there's you know, different personas we've identified in the institution. And depending on who you are, we could actually tune relevancy, which I think is where we're, we're inevitably heading. Uh, as part of that, there's obviously a lot of frequently asked questions, a lot of uh, short answer questions, and those are being captured as part of this uh, exercise as well. Yeah, so there's a number of different uh, phases there. Wonderful. Well, we are out of time, unfortunately, but please join me in thanking our wonderful panelists for their insights today. Thank you very much.